Hello. In this video, we're going to continue to explore classes and objects, and we're going to look specifically at something called hiding information, a process called encapsulation. This process is very important, and I want everyone to understand that you always encapsulate. The hopes is that by the end of this presentation, you see why. So let's set the stage. Imagine that I have a main method, and that main method is going to modify some object. For the sake of this conversation, we're going to assume it's the same fraction object we've been working with in the last couple presentations. So a fraction object has two fields, one integer numerator, num, and one integer denominator, den. So if I want to change the denominator of fraction f, I say f dot den equals zero. And sure enough, that will change the denominator. So my question is, what's the problem? The problem is one of mathematics. Denominators can't equal zero. And as the person that designed this fraction class, I've decided that I never want the denominator to be zero. So how, does, how do we manage this as a programmer? What we do is we put an instance method in between. And so that instance method is going to manage any changes to the object's fields. So encapsulation is the process of hiding information about an object so that only certain classes can change it. You can encapsulate both fields and methods. So essentially, we're going to have some instance methods, and those instance methods are going to be used to access fields and change fields. And that's the only way you're going to be able to get at them. So we might make a method called setDen. So we can see here we're invoking this instance method using the implied object f and we're passing this method 4. So it might look something like this. And we can see in here that what the method does is it says if a is not equal to 0, set den equal a, else print out invalid. How this actually works is completely up to the programmer. This is just one possible way to manage the situation. So sure enough this will work and this will change our denominator to 4. And my question for you is what are the benefits of using instance methods in this fashion? Well, it allows error checking inside the class. That means it's standard for any user of the class. Remember, we're writing these classes and their blueprints or templates how to do things. I might share that class with a bunch of people. And for over, order for those people to collaborate and, and share things that, with that common class in mind is they have to, they have to work the same. So what it does is it means that the error checking is standard for everyone. It's managed by the class in the class. So if I want to work with someone, I can be sure that certain things are always going to be true. One in this case is that denominator will never be zero. This also reduces your code because if you write this, this checking process inside an instance method, you write it once and can use it numerous times. So the question now for you is, have I effectively hidden the information? Well, no, I can still do this, and I bypass that instance method. So what we have to do is we have to find a way of stopping the user from being able to access that field directly using f.den. So we imagine what we put up is a force field around the object. And so if the user tries to change the field, an error occurs. To do this, we change the modifier in front of each field. We make the modifiers private. What that means is you cannot change that field unless you are inside of the class. So in order to get into the class, you need to access that instance method. Animation was a little off there. So modifiers tell the program who can access the class, methods and fields. There are three modifiers that we think about, only two of which are part of our course and are actually on the AP exam. The first one is public. The method or field can be accessed by anyone. The second one is private. The method or field can be accessed through the class, so it's very restricted who can change it. The third modifier that's useful is called protected. I, I speak to this here because inevitably you will come across this and you will also find this modifier very useful in certain situations. And we'll talk about those a little later. So we have two types of instance methods that we typically set up. They are called accessors, or get methods, and mutators, set methods. Methods that access fields are called accessors or get methods. 
Methods that change fields are called mutators or set methods. Both of these are instance methods because they can get and set information about a specific instance. It's good practice to group your get and set methods together, however it's not necessary. And finally, this is a standard practice across all classes. Programmers will, will do this as a standard practice. Anytime you need to get some information, they will call their method get something. Anytime you need to set some information, they will call their method set something. So here, for example, is the JFrame class. And you can see that there's a whole bunch of get methods built into it. There's get accessible context. There's get context pane. This is how I access information about the JFrame class. It's important to note out that the, these are these are the access there and get methods that are in the JFrame class. It actually has additional get methods that are inherited from its superclasses. And on the right hand side here, we have the hierarchy. Now this again is, is a little more complex than what we want to get into right now. But for those of you who are interested, it's important to recognize that how do you read this documentation? This is the online documentation with the JFrame class. This defines the hierarchy. A JFrame is a frame. A frame is a window. A window is a container. A container is a component. A component is an object. So JFrame has all the attributes and behaviors of these classes that are higher in the hierarchy. Hierarchy goes from general to specific. JFrame being more specific, object being more general. So if we scroll down here in our documentation, here, here are the methods that are in the JFrame class, and these are the methods that are inherited from these superclasses. Again, this isn't as important at this point, but it's useful to start kind of thinking about these things. Same thing goes for mutator methods. So, really quick example here. Essential idea is you must encapsulate all fields. So your field must have private. Form, this is a common way people will write out, people will write out shorter methods. So they'll do it all in one line. This is used to save space. This is a standard practice. So remember our standard practice is all accessor methods are, are, are get something, all mutator methods are set something. And an essential point of understanding is that encapsulation allows error checking to happen inside the class. This reduces code and allows for easier modification to all instances. It also, I would like to add, makes it easier to change your class. So if you decide you want to change how your object behaves, you only have to change it in one spot. So let's look at a quick multiple choice question. So give you a second to read it. You could actually pause, so I'm not going to give you long enough to read it says, which of the following could replace the missing code in the move method? So here's some class called clock. Here's our move method. So we're going to read the header. Moves this clock one minute forward. So let's start with the first line. So this clock would move the minutes one minute forward. But remember, with a clock, if you, go out, if you hit 60 minutes, you have to reset your clock, increase your hour, put minutes back to zero. So this is never going to call the normalize method. And in fact, it's going to make a whole new instance. So option one can disappear. So we can eliminate three of the answers simply by realizing option one isn't valid. Option two is valid because option two is going to increase mins, and then it's going to invoke the normalize method, which is down here which is going to account for that situation where if minutes passes 59. And option three is valid because if we call set hours minutes, we notice the set method here actually normalizes inside of it. So the answer is two and three. The other thing that's interested, interesting about this specific example is notice normalize is a private method, meaning it can only be called from inside the clock class. Questions? Always encapsulate. So I hope this helped. Of course, if you have any questions, you can ask me in class. Or if you're not in my class, please feel free to post a question. I always love hearing from people.